Good morning. And happy Sabbath. Wow. Thank you, Elder Dits, for that amazing special music. Amen. And I don't know about you, but that's just proof that the right hands, anything can be a for God. Amen. Well, this morning, the sermon title for the senior bulletin is the least favorite condition. But before we get in there, we can And you know, today, as we dig into what I like to call the least favorite commission, we'll discover what God's remedy is for keep, an, an antidote for keeping us away be, from becoming fast food Christians. But before we dig into that, let's, let's bow our heads and let's invite God's presence once again into our worship service. My blessed Father, my Lord, my King, my Savior. Lord, we love you so much. And we just pray that as we take a moment to pause and just to learn more about you, that you open our ears and our hearts to your word today. Lord God, be my words. May they not be my own, but yours. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. So this morning... Before we jump into Luke, I'd like us to go back to the last two great commissions we just got done reading. And in, the first one's found in Matthew chapter 28, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 and 20. And this is nothing new for you. We, we went over this two weeks ago, and for those of you who might have missed it, Pastor Har Harley and I, we've been going through the Great Commission, because we had just got done studying through Revelation, and now we want to focus on evangelism. But before we get to Acts, we have to, go through all, we have to go through the Great Commissions. And so we find in Matthew 28, verses 8, 18 and 20, what many like to call the Great Commission. And it says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore go to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, the name of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything. I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always, to the very end of the earth. And then let's go to what we studied last week in Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. Mark 
And in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 to 20, Mark chapter 16, verses 15 to 20, it says, He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes with their hands, and they will drink deadly poisons. It will not hurt them at all. They will, th they will place their hands on the sick people, and they will get well. And then 1920 says, After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven, and he sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. And we get, these, we get these commissions, and we like it. Go, go, action, action. But let's go to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. And I want to show you why I think this is probably the, most, the least favorite commission of them all. Luke chapter 24, verses 40, and we're we'll read to 53. Luke chapter 40, verses 53. And God's word says, When he had said this, he showed them by his hand and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? Then they gave him a piece of fish, and he took it, and he ate it in their presence. Verse 44. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the, the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Christ will suffer and will rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are my witness of these, of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power on high. Then verse 50 to 53 says, When, they, when he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing him, he, lift them, uh, he, was, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continuously at the temple, praising God. And you see, this is why I think that this is the least favorite commission. Because did you see what happened? And Matthew and Mark, it says, go, go, go. <clears throat> but in Luke, Jesus says, wait. He says, wait for the, pow for the power on high. And my friends, in today's, <clears throat> in today's society, there's one thing we don't like to do. And that's wait. I mean, when was the last time you went to a doctor and you're like, yes, I'm going to wait in the waiting room? <laughs> it doesn't happen because we don't like to wait. But you see, in this last commission, we see that we need to wait for power on high. And my friends, I have a belief. You know, I, I believe there's a reason that evangelism doesn't work. And let, let, me, let me clarify. I believe that there's a reason that evangelism doesn't work because of how we do it. What if I told you our evangelism plan for the next three months was going to be to just wait and pray? What if I told you for the next three months all we were going to do is, is break up the church into small groups and pray in one hour a week together? You know, some people might think I'm crazy. And I know some people, they, they've I've heard you, some people have been giving me the nickname as Baby Pastor. And so they'd be like, Baby Pastor, since you're still a baby, we'll let you slide. But that, that doesn't work. Because nowadays, when it comes to evangelism, we're like, we need to do this, we need to do that, we need to do that. My friends, it's not about what we do. It's about what he does. And I want you to go back with me to Luke chapter 3, verses 21 and 23. Luke 
chapter 3, verses 21 and 23. And it's the story of Jesus being baptized. And in Luke chapter 3, verse 21, it says, when all, the people were being, or when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too, and he was praying. Heaven was open, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son who I, whom I love, with you I am well pleased. Now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. My friends, do you notice what just happened? Jesus had to wait for the leading of the Holy Spirit before he started his ministry. My friends, if Jesus, if God has to wait for God, how much more do we need to wait? And this reminds me of a story. When, when I was at Southwestern, um, I had a role as a student chaplain. And it's weird, as, as a student chaplain, the weirdest thing would happen. I'd be at the cafe, I'd be eating, you know, we'd be talking about homework and how much stressed out we are, and we'd start looking for gray hairs because of stress. And all of a sudden, like, we'd just be eating, and they start telling me their whole personal life. And at first, like, as, as a sophomore, I'm like, whoa, <laughs> like, we were just talking about being stressed out, how do we get to here? But I praise the Lord because He doesn't call the qualified, but He call, qualifies the called. And I remember one instance where I'm at, you know, I'm at the cafeteria and the same thing begins to happen. This young lady, she had a huge life decision. And she begins to tell me all about it. And it was way above the sophomore theology major's pay grade. I had no clue what to tell her. So all I said was, have you prayed about it? Have you prayed about it? And you know what she said? She said, you know what? I haven't. I've been too busy trying to figure everything out. My friends, could our problem be that we're so busy trying to figure things out that we forget to go to the solution? And one thing that I love about the Gospel of Luke is that Luke, more than any other Gospel, shows the power of prayer. And even more, it showed that Jesus prayed. So really quickly, I'd like for us to go to, through a journey through, uh, through Luke real fast to see the instances where Jesus prayed. So, st so stay in Luke 3, verse 21, going where we were about the baptism. And it says, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And he was praying. Now go with me uh, to Luke 5, verses 16 and 17. Luke 5, verses 16 and 17. And God's word said, But Jesus often withdrew to a lonely place and prayed. One day as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law, who had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem, were sitting there. My friends, before Jesus had his first collision with the Pharisees, he prayed. Now go with me to Luke chapter 12. Oh no, Luke chapter 6, verse 12. I'm sorry about that. Luke chapter 6, verse 12. And it says, One of those days Jesus went out to the mountainside to pray, and he spent the night praying to God. And if you continue reading, Before Jesus chose the twelve, he prayed. Now let's continue. Let's go to chapter 9, verse 18. Luke chapter 9, verse 18. Luke chapter 9, verse 18. And I want you to see, before asking his disciples who they thought he was, in Luke 9, chapter 18, it says, Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do the crowds say I am? Now go with me to Luke chapter 22, verse 31 and 32. Luke chapter 22, verses 31 and 32. I'm sorry you guys are getting your workout, but Luke chapter, <clears throat> Luke chapter 22, verses 31 and 32, and it says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked 
to shift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. But when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Jesus prayed for his disciples. And then finally, in Luke 23, verse 46, Luke chapter 23, verse 46, when Jesus is on the cross, it says, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he, breath, he breathed his last. My friends, Jesus had to pray. And if Jesus had to pray, how much more do we need to pray? You see, Jesus prayed to God for strength and encouragement and guidance. And my, it's amazing. If God had to talk to God for help, how much more do we, do man, does man have to talk to God for help? But you know, in this fast-paced life, sometimes we feel like, and I'll be honest, sometimes we feel like if I stopped and pray, it'd be a waste of time because I have so much to do. And, I've, and I hope you guys are like me and never felt that way. We're like, I have this huge to-do list, and if I took some time to pray, I'd be wasting time I could be doing the to-do list. And there's a quote I want to read to you from one of my favorite commentary writers, William Barclay. He says, The quiet time in which we wait on God are never wasted. For it is in these times when we lay aside life's task that we are strengthened for the very task we lay aside. My friends, in your life, if you feel like you're drowning with your to-do list, if you don't see any light at the end of the tunnel, that is the right time to pray. It's not a time to say I'm being more productive, not a time to make a better to-do list, but it's a time to go to God and say, God, my strength is not enough. And I want us to go to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, verses 5 and 9. And this is one of my favorite parables about prayer. Luke chapter 11, verses 5 and 9. And this is a story. And, it's, and Jesus says, Suppose one of you has a friend, and he goes to him at midnight and says, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine, uh, uh, mine on a journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. Then the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him the bread, because he is a friend. Yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So to understand this parable, we have to go back in time to what it was like in the Middle East. Because as you see in the Middle East, hospitality was a sacred duty. And so what happened was, people would come to your house and they would travel at night because to get away from the heat. And they travel at night, and they come to your house, and when they come as a host, it was your duty not to, not to just give them a little bit, but to give them an ample, an abundant amount of food, of supplies, whatever they need. But what happened is, in the days, they'd only bake as, uh, as much bread as they need for the day. Because if they bake too much, it gets stale and it go bad. So they'd only bake enough for the day, so when our friend came, they, most likely they wouldn't have anything for him because they just made up for that day. And if they didn't have any left in the supply closet, that's an embarrassing situation. So what this friend does is he goes over to his neighbor's house. And what we need to understand is in the Middle East, when they closed their door, that was like when you put a do not disturb thing on the handle. Because you see in the morning in the Middle East, when they wanted to talk to people, they'd leave their doors open. But when it was time to go to bed, they would close their door. And in the Middle East, for you to knock on the door was seen as the rudest thing you could do. And you were only supposed to do it if it was a huge emergency. So here we see the friend goes to the door. And one last thing to remember is that we have to remember what the houses were like. Most of the homes were just one room, little houses. And two thirds of it was, was just dirt ground. And then one third of the house was on a platform. And on the platform, most likely they'd have a charcoal stove. 
And at night, the whole family would sleep around the stove. And then this isn't like today, because today we all have our own beds. We like our personal space. But back then, they all slept together to keep warm. And the families, they weren't like, you know, four or five. A lot of families were eight, ten people big. And so imagine the man's knocking on the door. And there you are, you're sleeping. And you have your, little, you have your kids. You even have little Junior, two years old. And you hear someone knocking, you're like, go away, go away, because you'll, you'll wake the baby. But the, the man, who, your, your friend won't stop knocking. So finally you realize everybody's already up. So gradually you walk in like, okay, here's your supplies. Because everybody's up anyways. But I want us to, to continue reading. So let's go back to our Bibles to verses 10, verses 10 to, uh, to, verses 10 to 13, or 9 through 13. It says, So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the doors will be opened to you. For anyone who asks will receive. He who seeks will find. And he who knocks the door will be opened. Which of you, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you, you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in Heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? You know what I love about this story? It persists, being persistent works on an, on an old neighbor who doesn't want to get up because his kids are sleeping. How much more will persistent prayer work on a God who loves you so much that He gave His only one and begotten Son to die on a cross for you? My friends, knock and the door shall be open. Well, the problem is, sometimes I feel like we're not knocking. And this reminds me of two stories. The first story is found in the book, in a book uh, called The Book of Jabez. It's about, or the prayer of Jabez. It's about the prayer of Jabez and it goes through it. And there's a story. And it talks about a man who got into heaven. So he's in heaven and he finally gets to meet his guardian angel. You know, they're catching up, talking about times the guardian angel saved his life. And they're just walking through heaven. And as they're walking through heaven, the man, he looks and, there's, and he sees a warehouse in heaven. And he's like, that's weird. What is a warehouse doing in heaven? So he, you know, he nudges his guardian angel and he's like, hey, let's, what, what's, that, what's that warehouse doing? And he's like, oh, oh, you, you don't want to go over there. He's like, no, no, let, let, can, can we check it out, please, please? So finally the angel's like, okay, we can go check it out. So they go over to the warehouse and they, and they open up and there's just whole storage racks full, full of just stuff. And he sees names all through it. And it's just this ginormous warehouse. And the man's looking at him and he's like, what is all this stuff? What is this doing in heaven? And the angel says, these are the blessings that God wanted to pour out on his people, but they never asked. My friends, if, if we don't ask, how can we expect to receive? But my friends, if we do ask, we know that we have a God in heaven, a Father in heaven, who will give us the strength we need for the day, give us the encouragement we need for the day, and who will give us the wisdom that we need. Now, I'm not saying if you pray to him for a Lamborghini, he's going to do that. But I am praying that if you're having a bad day, you don't know how you're going to keep on with your day, and that you need strength. If you, get, if you go down to your knees, he will give you strength. Now, the second story. The second story is found in Life Sketches. It's the story of Ellen G. White, and it's about when she first discovered the price that Jesus paid for her. You can see, when Ellen White was little, she thought that she would never be good enough for salvation. And she finally understand that it wasn't about her, but it was about him. And when she finally understood that, she got so excited, she went and she wrote a list. Names of her friends and family who didn't know Jesus, who she wanted to know Jesus. And in my sketches, it said that she would stay up all night praying, pleading to God for them. And then in the morning when she woke up, she would go to them, love them, and show them the truth. And in Life Sketches it says, the more she did that, the littler and littler her list got. My friends, Jesus is in the business of saving souls. And I once heard um, Pastor or Elder Mark Finley once said, as he was explaining prayer, he said that 
<laughs> that prayer is giving God an opportunity to work. My friends, when we pray, we're giving God an opportunity to work in our lives and to work in the lives of the people around us. My friends, we need to pray. Because you know, Jesus is coming soon. And we're going to need all the strength, we need all the encouragement, we need all the wisdom we can get. And, but there's one last point. And from my last point, I want you to go back to the commission found in Luke. Chapter 24, verses 44 and 45. 24, verses 44 and 45. And in verses 44 and 45, he, says, he said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. You know what is so wonderful? That Jesus used scripture to point to him. To prove to his disciples that he was the Christ. Now go back with me to the beginning of Luke 24, verses 13. And it's the story of the road of Emmaus. And many of you already know the story, so we're going to just briefly read through it for sake of time. It says, now, now the same day two of them were going to the village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And this is Luke 24, verses 13. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they were talking and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together, together about? They, they stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? Jesus asked. About Jesus and Nazareth, they, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deeds before God and all the people. The chief priests and the rulers handed him over to, this, to sentence him to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to rest, redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. And in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said to him, He was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, How foolish you are and how slow of heart to, believe all the, uh, to, to not believe all the things the prophets had spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? My friends, Jesus used scripture. And what's so amazing to me is because Jesus, when he met these two disciples, could have came as he is. He came with his crown on, in his glory, with his brilliant clothes, with angels all around him singing Hosanna. And instantly, those two disciples would have fell down on their knees and say, Jesus, you are the Christ. But what does Jesus do? He explains through scripture who he is. My friends, if the disciples use the scriptures, if Jesus used the scriptures, and if the scriptures were enough for Jesus, it's enough for me. And in your bulletin, there are listed a few Bible verses, and for the sake of time, we're not going to go through them all, but there are a few Bible verses that goes through from the Old Testament and proves that Jesus is Christ. And what's so amazing is, if you go through these, and I challenge you this, this Sabbath to go through with your family, and if you go through it, you will see that Jesus' life was predicted before he even lived it. My friends, the Bible is all we need. The Bible is all we need. And if you will turn with me to 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, 5 through 12. This will be our last Bible verse. 2 Thessalonians 2. 
5 through 12. Don't you remember that when I, was, when I was with you, I used to tell you these things. And now you know what is holding him back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret powers of lawlessness is already at work. But the one who now holds it back will continue, continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. Then the coming of the lost one will, will be in accordance with the work of Satan. And, and he will display all kinds of counterfeit miracles and signs and wonders and every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They will perish because they love, because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. My, friend, there's gonna, my friends, there's going to come a time but well, we have to make a decision. Are we going to take God at His word, or are we going to trust our eyes? Because when this time comes, our eyes will be saying, no, 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 that's, that's true. But our friends, will we have faith to believe in God's word? My friends, my prayer for you today is that you will. And to close, I have one final story. One final story. And there's a story about a football team. And this football team, just bless their heart, they could not win a game to save their life. So they, they just got beat 28 to 0. And they're, you know, they're in the locker room, depressed. And the, you know, the coaches don't even know what to say because they, they haven't won a game. And they're like, good, good, good try, guys. And all of a sudden, one of the, one of an oil, uh, CEO of an oil company walks through the door. And he makes a speech. And he says, this team represents our city. And I cannot tolerate to see you all lose one more game. So this is what I'm going to do. If you will win your next game next week, I will give each, each and every one of you a key to a new car, including the coaches. And you can imagine, the team was ecstatic. And so for the next week, for the next week, all they did was eat, sleep, football. And so finally the game came next week and it was against a rival team. The rival city team. And they were all pumped and the coach did the best pre-game speech he had ever done in his life. And the team, they had new energy that had never been seen before. And they ran out to the game and they played with their whole heart. And they lost. 30 to 0. Because my friends, Enthusiasm cannot take the place of hard work and discipline. My friends, I believe that Jesus is coming soon. And my friends, being a Christian isn't easy. That's why it says the narrow way. It takes hard work. And no matter how many sermons you hear, no matter how many prayer meetings go, how many, no matter how many Sabbath school, no matter how many songs you listen to, None of that can replace prayer and Bible study. And my friends, as God's people, we need to be, be known again as people of the book. As people of the Bible. So when people come to us asking us about our faith, we won't say, well, my pastor says. We'll say, well, you know, God's word says. But my friend, that starts every morning. And it's hard I know it's hard. But even if you don't feel like it, you need to open up your Bible and say, God, what do you have to say to me today? Because my friends, the greatest need for Christians, the greatest need to keep us from becoming fast food Christians is going back to the basics. And there's a song, and it's this easy yet this complicated. Read your Bible and pray every day and you'll grow, grow, row. My friends, all we need to do is read our Bibles and pray every day, and we'll grow, grow, grow. So to close, my pill for you today is two-part. 
One, to search your heart, to talk to God. And if you aren't having Bible studies, I encourage you this week to start a new habit. And the second one is the continuation from our appeal that Pastor Harley has been, um, has been appealing to you. And the appeal has been for each family to bring, this year to bring one person to Jesus. Just one person. And if each family brought one person to Jesus, we would probably need a new sanctuary. And I'm okay with that. But my appeal for you this Sabbath is for you every day to pray one minute for that person. So what does that mean? That means to make a sign, to put a reminder in your phone, to put it in your car, to put it on your fridge, put it by your bed. But for each day, for you to pray for that person. If there's a person in your mind, pray for them every day. If there's not a person in your mind, pray to God, God, I don't know who it is, but may I be ready for when you put them in my life. My friends, we need to be a praying church and a church that is known for reading the Bible. And so today, if you would be willing to pray one minute a day for that one person, I'd invite you to stand. Just one minute. That's all I'm asking. If you'd be willing to pray one minute a day for someone to discover their best friend, Jesus Christ, will you please stand? And while we're standing, I want to do something a little different. We start today. So we're going to take a minute right now, and I want you to pray for that person. And then I'll close with prayer. Lord, my God, my Savior, my King, Lord, we are your people, we are your church, and it is our deepest desire to follow you, Lord. My prayer is that each and every one of us, that as we leave today, we'll read our Bible and pray every day and grow and grow by your grace and your mercy. And Lord God, this year, may you answer our prayers. And may each one of us, each one of our families, bring someone to you, Lord, for your glory and your honor. Amen.